Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Modular Data Center Design. I'm your moderator, Amara Rauskas, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and Pure Power. I'm now happy to introduce today's distinguished speakers. Bill Kosick is Principal Energy Technologist for HP Critical Facilities, based in Chicago and working worldwide. His background is in mechanical engineering, and his expertise is in energy use modeling, analytics, and making recommendations for more than 120 data centers worldwide. He's a prolific author and presenter, and is a member of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. Brian Renner works in the electrical engineering discipline as platform leader and quality assurance manager with M&W US Incorporated, a company of the M&W Group. He also is based in Chicago and works on various projects across the country. Brian's specialization is in electrical power and life safety systems for commercial, industrial, governmental, and especially mission critical facilities. He also is a prolific author and presenter and is a member of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. I'm thrilled to have two of the most knowledgeable presenters on the topic here with us today. Welcome, Bill and Brian. Thanks, Amara. We're going to cover a wide variety of topics today on data center design as it relates to modular data centers. Just a couple opening slides. Obviously, when we're talking about data center design, specifically modular data centers, we need to be looking towards the future. Specifically, how do we future-proof these data centers so that they are modular, elastic, have standardized processes, are self-regulating, et cetera? There's a number of ways to do that, which we'll discuss today. One of the things that's really occurring that's driving not only modular data center growth, but data center growth in general, is this concept of the Internet of Things. We saw a big boom in Internet technology in the last 10 to 15 years, but what's happening today is really everyone in their pocket has a device or some type of technology that connects to the Internet in a pervasive way, causing a really, a really explosion of information. These are some of the, the major drivers in uh, new data center design and flexible and modular data center. To draw an analogy from an IT piece of equipment, if we look at this server, which consists of many multiple uh, little servers, it's completely flexible in the way it can grow, the types of platforms it can run off of, software, et cetera. And this is really a great example of how we move towards the future having different types of equipment running di different types of applications in different ways. These are the things that really are going to drive modular data center design in general. Brian? Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> so let's uh, give a brief introduction here to what we're talking about when we're talking about modular data centers. Primarily, we're talking about containers, but we're also talking about modular rooms. Among the containers, there are ISO containers and non-ISO containers, so let's talk about that. What do we mean when we mean containerized? You'll see a little picture down there on the right. Um, this kind of started off in the industry as something that could be rapidly deployed as a, as a small data center, uh, fit up with IT racks, loaded on the back of a tractor trailer truck, and delivered in this case uh, to a warehouse setting you see here uh, on, the, on the photograph. When we say ISO, those are really just standard, standard sizes, 10, 20, 40, 53 foot lengths, and about nine and a half foot width typically. Uh, a key item here is these are built to UL standards. Um, you know, being an electrical guy, I kind of sometimes look at these as uh, manufacture. Uh, like I used to look at uh, pre-manufactured air handling units. You know, they have multiple components in them, but often they'll have one or two connections of power. But these these are fit up with IT racks, and they can be in a, in a typical container. They can have up to 19 conventional IT racks. Each rack can uh, support from anywhere from three to 40 kilowatts or more, depending on manufacturers. Uh, per rack, IT rack, inside those units. The non-ISO ISO can be built to any size. And one of the key um, things we're to note is uh, these can be built, the non-ISO, the larger containerized, kind of the, the trailers, uh, can be built to uh, IFB and IFC codes and can, and can be occupied, can be designed to be occupied. 
the, the ISO containers are usually just treated as a piece of equipment, and we'll talk about that more. Modular rooms, these can be stick built. Uh, Bill's going to show a slide uh, of a traditional uh, expandable uh, modular uh, stick built room. They can be pre pre manufactured or prefabricated and assembled on site. They are expandable. They have rapid deployment uh, the, the, the over, over traditional stick built uh, data centers, and generally the same features as conventional stick built data centers. So, a little bit more about containerized. They come in a lot of different options, a lot of different features. They're all in ones where the, the IT racks, the pan, electrical panels, and the cooling are all in one unit. There is ones with just IT data racks in them by themselves, and they get their power and cooling from outside units. There are uh, main distribution or IDF, uh, MDF and IDF uh, rooms that uh, serve a particular function. You can also get containers that just have power gear and UPS in them, and then there are cooling modules. They can be located inside or outside a structure. We showed the photograph of a warehouse. Uh, there are installations where they sit straight outside in the open uh, environment. Uh, there are ones where they sit under kind of a, 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 a semi-open structure that where they're partially enclosed. The code officials in a lot of places are often unfamiliar with these units. Uh, one of the things we've in, encountered in some locales is them wanting to treat them as rooms because they, they struggle with the concept of a modular container being like a piece of equipment, like I said, in a large packaged uh, air handling system. Um, they are rapid, uh, scalable, and deployable uh, de uh, deployment environments where they, you really want to get up and running quickly. A traditional stick built might take you months and months, 12 months. Uh, some of these units can be deployed in as, as much as 12 to 14 weeks. And Bill's going to talk to you a little bit about the IT equipment inside these units. Thanks, Brian. One of the things when considering modular data center design is the IT equipment and how it performs against its given mission. In this slide, I wanted to just show a little bit about some of the energy efficiency of the servers over the last six years. What the slide shows in the blue bar is the maximum power draw from a server, and the green bar is the minimum power draw. You can see back in 2007, there was very little difference. So when a computer was basically idling, it was using maybe 60% of the energy of when it's fully utilized. Fast forward to 2013, you could start to see that that percentage is much smaller, meaning that when a server has low utilization, it's using a lot less power than when it's fully loaded. When we look at those same servers and we put them in uh, varying ambient uh, temperature conditions, you start to see that as we pass maybe 28, 30 degrees C, we start to see the server fans beginning to ramp up. And what this means is that while we may be saving energy on the mechanical side, which I'll talk about in a minute, we see an increase in the server energy consumption or server power draw. And this is something that's really important to understand especially when we get into smaller, uh, more dense, compact, modular data center design. When we look at the ASHRAE environmental classes, A1 through A4, these were really designed to provide temperature and humidity conditions for the servers in a data center, A1 being the coolest and having the smallest uh, envelope in terms of humidity and temperature and A4 being the greatest uh, temperature and widest envelope. When we look at a data center energy consumption over different climate zones on the x-axis there, going from 1A to 7, which represents hot and humid basically to very cold, we start to see that the energy consumption of the different ASHRAE zones really changes as we go across the different climate zones, meaning as we get colder, there's very little difference in energy consumption whether we're using an A1, an A2, or an A3, or even an A4 when we get to very cold climates. This is another part of this uh, puzzle in terms of determining what is the most efficient way to design a modular data center and what is the best temperature profile to use in that data center. If we widen it out and look globally, this graph represents about 100 different locations across the globe, 
and an energy consumption analysis done at each one of these locations. From left to right is the lowest latitude to the highest latitude. So you can see towards the left there, the equatorial locations have the highest PUE as we would expect, hot and humid. And then as we go all the way to the right, we start to see a much lower uh, energy consumption. The point here is that going from different climate zones, we can have a tremendous change in the energy consumption just by the climate zone, all, all else being equal. So as we set out to design modular data centers, flexible facilities, et cetera, it's important to make sure that we're matching the design with the climate that it's being put in. An example of some of the cooling system technology that can be used in the modular data centers, and this would be primarily um, larger data centers, and I'll talk a little bit about specifics in a second, using the evaporative or direct evaporative outdoor air type air handling units or heat wheels or air-to-air -air heat exchangers. There's a lot of different technologies that can be used. The point here is that these are much smaller kind of modular approaches to the cooling strategies that, that can be used. Now, certainly these are not the only strategies that can be used, but these lend themselves well to this design. For example, using these multiple cooling units, uh, they're really adaptable to the different climate zones, and depending on the loading of the IT equipment, they give us a really good efficiency in terms of ramping up and ramping uh, down the different units. And, and certainly from a growth standpoint, they also allow for future expansion in a, in a much smaller, more um, modular way that requires less uh, capital. When we start to talk about the energy efficiency specifically of the modular data centers, this is where these types of data centers can have a distinct advantage over their um, more monolithic, much larger uh, cousins legacy data centers. The top graph shows when we start to increase the IT load in a data center, we start to see a different proportion between a portion between the actual IT load here shown in orange and the facility kind of base level load shown in green. So all the way on the left there where we have very little IT load, say in a day one scenario, you can see that the, the, the base energy consumption has nothing to do with the IT load, is, is either equal to or greater than the IT load. And this really creates uh, difficulty in terms of the PUE number which I'll show in a second. And you could see over time um, that that proportion really um, evens out and we start to see more, much more normal operation to closer to 100%. And the lower curve, showing it a little different way, we could start to see that at very low load, all the way on the left of that curve, we could see PUEs easily higher than 5 or even 10 in some cases, depending on the initial IT load. And as we get towards maybe 20, 25, up to maybe 50% when we start to see a leveling out of the PUE based on a facility. So really we need to understand that when, when we're in a modular design, modular data center, we can really control that IT load as a proportion of the overall load by having kind of more discrete, smaller modules than in a monolithic data center. Brian had some really good information on, on these types of data centers. I just wanted to kind of tag on to that a little more and talk about um, some of the different types of data centers that are still considered modular or, or, or a flexible facility. First of all, each one of these does have a path forward in terms of flexibility and expansion. Um, certainly the traditional data center there on the left where we can take the whole block, including the uh, data center, power cooling, et cetera, and really mirror it or make a new data center just like it. That is just you know one simplistic way of looking at this. Similarly with the modular and the industrialized uh, modular data centers as well. So each one of these has a distinct um, growth path expansion. 
they're, they're going to do in a diff, each one is going to do it in a little different way, and it's going to li- do it in a little different uh, time frame and and uh, co- cost level. As an example, when we look at a traditional modular data center, we might have a phase one that includes the administrative and other support spaces as kind of a central function area, and then the phase one data center and infrastructure, power and cooling infrastructure, is built as one piece. Now when we go to add phase two and phase three of the technology pieces, we really don't have to touch any of the admin and support spaces. We can really just build on the technology and power and cooling infrastructure. So it's certainly it's modular. The, the modulars, modules tend to be a little larger, but certainly it gives us flexibility. It gives us the ability to do multi-tier level um, in different data center, different technology areas. In the container, kind of a little different, uh, in the different end of the spectrum there, we can have a container that can stand alone as a chilled water unit, as, a, as an example, where there's coils inside the container. We pipe chilled water into it, give it power, and it can stand on its own. Or on the right there, in the upper right, we can have a a container that actually has built-in adiabatic uh, fresh air cooling that can operate completely independently of any kind of major cooling infrastructure. So these are different different variables that occur in different climates, different cost uh, price points, et cetera. So there's a lot of different ways to set up a, a container modular data center. And finally, the industrialized modular data center, it's kind of a hybrid of those two where we have portions of the facility um, that are that are built hard built stick built into the into the uh, site, but then we have a a lot of different power and cooling components that get built off site, tested, shipped to the site, and um, startup can occur that way much quicker to uh, deploy. Um, the ability to have different uh, tier levels within the data center, scalable, efficient. So there's a lot of advantages of this um, as it combines some of the best parts of the traditional data center and the containerized data center. Just a little closer look there in one kind of one quadrant, if you will, of that data center. You could start to see that the data center itself has the, the row and aisle configuration with the cooling units that can be installed over time to match the load, match the IT load. And then similarly on the right, we have electrical substations, generator, UPS that can be expanded as the IT load grows as well. So it gives us flexibility in terms of having a kind of hard built building, if you will, and then the scalable over time um, power and cooling infrastructure. So just kind of a summarize some of the points that I'm making here before I turn it back over to Brian. Um, climate is really important, and this is true of all, really all buildings, but when we start, start to talk about modular data centers, it really makes it a, a big impression, uh, especially as we talk about different types of modular cooling strategies. And when we you know, kind of move down into the data, data center level, uh, looking at different economization, uh, modularity, evaporative cooling, some of these are just some of the kind of high-level discussion points when we get to looking at energy efficiency strategies. And the last two points there, convergence and synergies, this really has to do with understanding the indoor ambient temperature and how that affects the server power and how the server uh, upper level and lower level power in terms of the the turndown ratio will affect the overall power draw in the data center in the module and how that modularity then can improve the overall efficiency and the overall cost effectiveness of the data center. With that, I'll turn it back to Brian. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> so let's talk about um, electrical, electrical connections to these uh, containerized uh, data centers. Um, typically, you know, we talk about the IT and the servers. Um, a lot of manufacturers will ship these completely configured with servers. Uh, kind of a turnkey solution. A lot of times uh, they'll just uh, send it without the, without the IT equipment, but uh, allow you to bring in your own racks or they'll furnish empty racks. But in all cases, these are going to be pre-wired electrically 
and ready to go. So from an electrical standpoint, you're really looking at this as kind of a black box, but we're going to talk about what's inside that box because I think it's important. One of the things to know is that for a typical ISO container, the total IT load, and that's not the mechanical load that might come in the container, is about one megawatt. So um, you might get 1.2 with some manufacturers, 740 kilowatts with others, but that's a rough rule of thumb. They're available in all sorts of voltage levels, 120, 208, 400, 415, 480, and 600 volts in some uh, international locations. They also take multiple power sources, and we'll talk about the tier levels. Tier ratings. Um, one organization, the Uptime Institute, uh, provides tier level ratings for data centers. And these tier levels from one to four talk about the amount of redundancy, the reliability, the maintainability of these, unit, of these data centers. And you, they also apply and can be used in containerized and modular systems. So you can set up a modular and containerized system in, in any uh, tier rating that you want. These containers come in all sorts of different options. Um, you can get them uh, an all-in-one data center, and that's what I'm going to show next, but you can get them all-in-one data center. You can get them with IT only, IT and cooling. You can get them with separate or separate power modules. And we're going to go through a couple uh, examples. The first one is the combined DC uh, data center module. This is, those of you who are familiar with just basic conventional stick data centers, this diagram just kind of shows a, a data center in a box. It's very simple. Uh, you've got uh, a couple of IT racks there in the center. You've got a UPS in the upper right. You've got uh, AC distribution panels uh, along the southern half wall. You've got some DX cooling units. So th this, is, this is familiar to a lot of people who understand a traditional room data center, but they've just put it all in one in a container. This ships to the site. Again, you can have the servers in there, not have the servers in there. But from an electrical standpoint, um, you just plug into it. Now, I do want to show there should be a tab for a level three single line diagram somewhere in your uh, uh, web layout. And if you click on that tab, you'll be able to see a sample level three or tier three single line diagram for one of these containers. It basically shows that you can get these in multiple power connections, hookups to this, this containerized box. This one line shows two, uh, two connections, an A and a B for the uh, rack systems. The rack systems or the, the servers typically have their own, have a dual corded system, that is they have a little transfer switch inside each server that allows them to go back and forth and be fed by two sources. And in this case, the one line shows that the mechanical and lighting systems are fed only by one of the, uh, of the sources. So we've got dual A and B paths to the servers and a single source to the mechanical which is a typical example of a, of a Tier 3 electrical design system. Okay, we talked about the connections. There's a lot of different ways we can connect these containerized data centers uh, from the external. And this is, you know, to a certain extent, electrically, once you know what's inside the box, this is really what you're talking about. You're talking about how do I connect up this box, just like you connect up an air handler. Um, you can get these uh, plug-in connections. You're seeing here multiple power sources, A, B, emergency, non-emergency. Uh, you also can do them just like, again, with an air handler with a disconnect mounted, uh, say, on a Unistrut stand or uh, next to the container, uh, 1600 amp, 1200 amp, uh, feeding this unit or multiple disconnects if you've got uh, multiple A and B feeds to the unit. So, again, you know, not too complicated, but it gives you an idea of, of what we're talking about here. All right, let's talk about the things beyond the IT container and what, what you might have. Uh, Bill showed an industrialized um, uh, containerized, which is a hybrid mix of containers, UPS generators, and switchgear. Most of you have probably seen generators that are meant for outdoor uh, environments, so those are, there's nothing new there. Uh, generators can be built in containers, walk-in, non-walk-in, skinned. But, uh, and you also, if you've done some industrial or uh, large commercial projects, you also know that uh, switchgear can also be built in outdoor enclosures. And that's really what I'm going to show uh, next in the next slide. This is an example of one of those ISO containers uh, that's being fit up with, uh, in this case, uh, power switchgear. And um, the benefit to this, again, is, you know, this is all tested assembled and shipped to the site, ready to connect to the other IT containers next to it. 
So you're avoiding a lot of field installation, a lot of field errors, a lot of construction time in the field. Um, in this case, the, the limitation on the shipping time, you know, might be depending on the type of gear and what you've got in there, might be 16 weeks, might be 14 weeks, or it might be 20 weeks. The container itself, they have to get the gear from a supplier and then put it into their, the, the manufacturer's container. Lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about grounding. Um, this is a, a, an area that's kind of critical to data centers, and it applies to containerized data centers as well. Um, you're going to have grounding set up and pre-wired in the container to all the racks, the panels that you're seeing inside this. And then these are going to have to, these ground connections are going to be taken to an outside connector on the, on the containerized uh, data center to a ground bar. Now that ground bar is going to have to connect to all your other containers on site, your other systems. You're going to link this together in a low impedance system less than 5 ohms. Now if this is, uh, these containers again can be placed outdoors in an open environment. They can be placed under a partial shelter. That's real popular in some of the applications we've been doing or they can be in a warehouse application. And so these external grounding connections are still some things the electrical engineers have to design. You still have to design a grounding system to hook up all of these containerized systems. So that's a pretty good overall uh, view of electrical. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Bill. Uh, both Brian and Bill recommended a variety of different places to get information. Here are a few resources for you. And are you both ready to take on some questions? Sure. Thanks. All right. So type your questions for today's presenters in the Ask a Question box on your screen. Please indicate which speaker you would like to answer your question by ty typing his name before your question. As a reminder, if you're on Twitter, you can tweet your questions to us by using the hashtag CSE Modular Data Center. We will get to as many questions as we can and questions will be answered here verbally during this session, and within a few days, the presentation and the Q&A session will be available for on-demand viewing. If you are registered, we will send you an email when it's ready so you can watch it and listen to it again. And you can also access this webcast via the Consulting Specifying Engineer homepage. All right, well, let's take on some questions here. All right, so the very first question is probably a little loaded. Let's talk about cost. Brian, I'm going to throw this one out to you. Let's, let's talk about the cost of these modular data centers. Can you give us the ballpark? Obviously, we, we don't have exact numbers. Well, you know, I think it, it, it varies so much. You know, uh, if you're going to talk about something that's fit up, with uh, servers and equipment, you could be talking millions if you're talking, or a million. If you're talking about the containerized uh, data center just set up with cooling, a couple hundred thousand. But it's going to vary. I mean, uh, uh, the, the power, say the power switchgear unit, 100,000 maybe. You know, these are all rough numbers. But it really, these things are so variable and, and different. I don't know, Bill, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a great point, Brian. It, it really, you really need to look at what you're buying, obviously, because um, most manufacturers in general, say on a containerized side, will sell the container with the internals, with or without IT, but it really won't include the um, power and cooling infrastructure that needs to go along with it. So, I mean, on average, you know, you, you may see a containerized uh, data center with, power and cooling in the, you know, maybe 50 to 60 to 70-ish percent of what would be a typical data center, but obviously there's so many different um, situations and variables involved. That, that's a, those are really, really rough numbers. The point is, is that it's less capital intensive and it can be delivered more quickly. And then for some um, customers, the more quickly part is more important than the less capital part. Okay, that's great information. And we're going to kind of continue along that line. We've got another question here about um, the maintenance and operational implications of modular versus stick-built data centers. Um, is there a cost trade-off with regard to maintenance? Uh, talk a little bit about preventive maintenance. I mean, where do we begin? Brian, do you want to? 
grab that one? Well, I'll talk about the, the power side of it. Uh, in the, maintenance, the maintenance and operations are the same for any power switch gear, any UPS that you're going to have. On those modules, you're going to need to um, follow uh, established uh, NEDA standards uh, on, uh, on uh, maintenance, acceptance testing, maintenance testing. Uh, they're going to be, um, obviously, in containerized, there's, there's a little bit of a challenge because of the, the space and working around them is not as great as you might have in a conventional stick build. But, yeah, the maintenance is still going to be there for those equipment. Uh, the, the, Bill can talk about the, the data center itself or the, the containerized data centers, but uh, it also depends on the user um, if uh, how they're, in certain enterprise users, they demark the container and uh, turn that over to an IT vendor for maintenance, the inside of that. Other uh, owners were going to own the unit and put their own equipment and maintain them inside. Bill? Yeah, I mean, it, it is really the same in terms of the, of the, say, the cooling equipment side in terms of um, testing and commissioning maintenance um, uh, procedures, et cetera. And so, so it really ends up depending on Brian, like you're saying, uh, who, whose side of the fence is it on? If, if it's a if a total um, package from the IT vendor that includes the um, the fans and all of the power distribution inside the container, versus the all of the power and cooling infrastructure falling on the owner's shoulder, it's, it, it 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 depends. One way or the other, the owner is going to pay for it, whether they're paying for it through their own maintenance budget or from the vendors. Um, agreement that they have with them from the contract. So the bottom line is it has to happen and it probably has to happen in just the same way in order to, to keep the same reliability levels. Right. All right, very good. Thank you. And Bill, that was a great segue to our next question. Do modular data centers require commissioning and testing? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, this is a very similar to the last question um, in that it really depends on the type of data center. When we're talking about a container, uh, most of that will be completely assembled and tested off-site. Um, so when it arrives on-site, it's 100% uh, functional and ready to go. Um, but the balance of the power and cooling equipment absolutely will need to be commissioned in a more of a traditional way um, by the uh, contractors on-site. Um, again, it's going to fall into the same discussion as before. It has to be done. It's just a matter of who does it and and where it gets done and how it gets done and um, documented it at the end of the day. Okay, very good. Thank you, Bill. Switch topics here just a little bit and talk about codes. Um, what are some applicable codes or what are some best practices for modular data centers? In your experience, Brian, well, we touched on this a little bit earlier, and with regards to the codes and local authorities, it, most of these containers are going to be built to UL standards. That is, they're, they're really viewed as a piece of equipment. Where in some applications and in, in industrialized or, or non-ISO containers, you might, and particularly for like an MDF or IDF room that's, uh, that's pre-manufactured, those are going to be built to the same types of codes, uh, uh, international fire code, international building code, that you build a conventional building to. And they're meant to be occupied. They're meant to have someone inside of it working. Um, so th the problem we've had in, some, like I said, some locales, a container will show up. Like I, we showed that picture of a small all-in-one data center with the racks and the power and the UPS in it. That is built to a UL standard. It's, it's, again, like a packaged air handling. You can walk into some of these air handling units and do servicing. But some inspectors may require you to make some modifications, notably fire protection, to make these uh, acceptable to them as a small walk-in building. Uh, so the, the codes in terms of, of those are the biggest things we run into in terms of codes is how they classify the equipment. So, Brian, if code officials are confused by these units, you know, what issues in the field can you take as an engineer? What measures are being taken to address this overall? Is it all coming from UL, or where is, where is this Well, we've, we've, we've worked with um, the international code inspectors and authorities and asked for clarifications and interpretations, provided those to the authorities having jurisdiction. But remember that most codes, and National Electrical Code is an example, those aren't, the code itself is only applicable as local authority or local city or, or town adopts it. 
And even if they adopt it, the ultimate authority is that local inspector. So you can only go so far with, you know, throwing the book at the inspector or even going outside to na uh, national organizations and asking for formal interpretations. Um, and you can get those. Certainly, you know, pointing to an enclosure and saying, well, there's a UL label on it, it's a piece of equipment, is, you know, the first level of discussion with the local authority. But you can also bring along the manufacturers of these containers. They've got lots of uh, national and international experience. They can, they can provide the type of information to show uh, that these units are safe and operable and not meant to be occupied. So again, following this train of thought, how does the design engineer work with a modular data center? What is your role? What kind of engineering documentation do you need? How do you, okay. do you solicit the modular? Well, that's, that's a good pricing? question. It, it can go both ways. We've got some, uh, some clients that know exactly the type of IT equipment they want. They're ordering these units um, as, a, as a piece of equipment, pre-ordering them, and we just have to hook them up. Now, as an electrical engineer, that might mean that I'm going to design um, the, the substations, the medium to low voltage uh, substations and gear and generators to provide basically hookups to these, let's call them black boxes, for, for a better word of what's going on with these containers. There are some clients who are not uh, as uh, familiar with the containers, want a containerized data center, and they want the consulting engineer to help them specify a container, including the internal the internal components of it, just like we'd write a spec for an air handler or a walk-in switch gear, and we help them out, go out and solicit bids. So you can do it one of two ways. Uh, you can you can help the owner select and go out for bids for these modular containers, or they may already know what they want, and they just want you to provide the infrastructure, the site, to help them power them up. Yeah, I mean, really, that's you captured it there. One of the other areas that has to be considered is the density of the IT equipment, and um, Brian, as you mentioned, the owner may choose to buy the container kind of fully loaded with all the servers ready to go, or they may choose to buy it only partially loaded, and what that means um, in terms of the power and cooling load to the, to the actual container, it's going to vary tremendously. So as we look to put the containers on a site that has an existing uh, chilled water system as an example, it's really important to understand what is the capacity of the chilled water, what is the temperature, what are the hookups, where is it located, how does the piping uh, get there, um, you know, how do we pump it, a number of things related to actually getting, in this case, the cooling component um, to, the, to the container. So it, it is a discovery process, just like, you know, doing any basis of design it's just now we have a um, little more tighter constraints in terms of the actual um, um, data center that the equipment will go into. Okay, so let's follow that train of thought there, Bill. We've got a couple questions here about modular data centers being deployed in places where there are perhaps tornadoes, or can they be deployed in a case of, for example, Hurricane Katrina to back up a facility where the traditional data center went down. Can you talk a little bit about containerized systems or modular data centers being used in situations where maybe there are some interesting hazards that we're not traditionally dealing with at a data center? Well, I think any data center has to be designed in a way that meets the requirements of the owner. So if the data center needs to withstand a F4 tornado or, or a hurricane or sandstorm or whatever it may be, it needs to meet those requirements. So to put, just, I mean, to put any type of equipment um, in a zone where we're going to have um, tornado or high winds it, without the proper support or enclosures really doesn't work. So there's nothing inherently different about a containerized data center in making sure that it's designed in a way that it can withstand, in this case, the winds or, um, or whatever the environment is. Similar to if you had cooling towers located outside or a generator, it's the same type of thing. So there's really, you know, the, the only thing that would be advantageous is, in this case, after the um, catastrophe is quick deployment of a data center 
um, that needs to go in place of an, of an existing data center that perhaps was uh, damaged and, and rendered inoperable. That would absolutely be a perfect application. But in terms of um, kind of proofing, uh, proofing it from um, different um, events, natural disasters, it really has to be treated just like any other uh, building or outdoor piece of equipment. So, Brian, to toss a similar question to you, what about lightning protection on a modular data center that's outside? Lightning protection, <clears throat> again, just like external equipment, is, is, has to be evaluated for each site. Uh, you know, uh, NFPA 780 has, uh, has guidelines, and you have to do a risk assessment. Most data centers are going to want lightning protection. Um, again, it also depends. You know, we talked about the fact that these containers can be located inside a, a, a structure, you know, like a warehouse or a pre-manufactured building. Uh, they can be located outside or they can be located partially covered by an, a semi-open structure. Uh, we've done those quite a bit too. But lightning protection is usually part of the system. Uh, you can, uh, you've got to look at not only the, the container itself, but if there's discharge stacks, uh, you've got to look at that, and that's all got to be provided. Okay. So modular data centers inside, outside, here's a question I think we'll start with you, Bill. If you were to place a modular data center in a warehouse, you'd need to consider the heat rejected from the container into the warehouse. Has that added load placed on the warehouse HVAC system been considered um, when you're looking at the energy efficiency of the data center? Sure. Um, I mean, this, uh, you know, as a consultant, I always start my answers with it depends. Um, but in this case, it really dep it depends on the type of, container it is because, um, you know, if you have a container that is, you know, self-contained with the cooling, ventilation, all of that, there's really very little, if any, heat rejection from the container outside into the, into the, um, the warehouse or the, the shell building or whatever it may be. Now, if you have a, a container or some type of enclosure that indeed discharges the heat into the surrounding, you know, building. Yeah, absolutely. That see, then that becomes less of what I would consider a true container, and then more into um, maybe more of an industrialized, where you're putting in, say, big big rows or racks of of IT equipment with um, kind of internal fans that will discharge the heat into the surrounding area. So. If you have that situation, certainly you need to provide the cooling and that will affect the energy efficiency of the overall facility. Or if you have, say, chilled water piped directly to, to the container and it's self-contained, that will affect it in a, in a different way in that we can capture that heat right at the source, right in the container. Yeah, I think, you know, Bill brought up a good point. It depends on the type of cooling you're using and what type of system you're setting up for these containers. Uh, you know, in some of the warehouse applications we've seen, you're going to have you might have chilled water. In that case, you're not really adding a lot of heat into the into the into the warehouse space itself. We've had some applications with adiabatic cooling where you're discharging a lot of hot air, and in those cases where we've had a structure or a partial structure, what we've ended up doing is uh, having these um, kind of hoods to pick up the heat off the discharge of the unit and take them up above the roof line. Uh, so that the that the air around the units is either at ambient or just slightly conditioned for maintenance personnel, but the real heat is being rejected up through the roof and out. So can you bury a modular data center? Can you put it underground? Have you ever seen that? No, I haven't. Okay. I thought that was an interesting question that came through. I guess if you put it in a, con in a concrete vault, waterproof concrete vault with access, yeah, you could put it underground. Okay. All right, interesting question. So, Bill, this one, I guess, is more for you. How is mechanical ventilation or cooling air typically handled for the interior modules? I mean, can you explain that yeah. a little bit better? Sure. So, so maybe I'll just take a minute. In the true kind of containerized data center that looks like, you know, the back of a tractor trailer, it will or it could have cooling coils above the 
or adjacent to the the row of IT equipment. It would be one row of IT equipment, and the hot air is rejected into the hot aisle and then recirculated through the, the chilled water coil, which has fans associated with it, back into the cold aisle. So it's really a closed-loop system that requires to, uh, chilled water basically acting like a large um, in-row a fan coil unit in a way, if you think about it. Totally closed loop chilled water. Another way would be um, having a, um, a unit that uses, say, free air cooling in climates where we can use uh, direct outside air, and if we need a little bit of a temperature drop, we can use adiabatic cooling, you know, putting a little mist into the incoming air to drop the temperature. And depending on the, the inlet conditions that the customer needs and the climate, we can usually run that without any mechanical cooling um, in, in more mild climates. So that, that those in a container, those are really the, the, the primary ways to cool. In, in more of the industrialized or flexible facility um, um, kind of hybrid, we're using much more of a conventional air handling unit approach but we're doing it in a way that is modular in that it directly relates to the growth of the IT. So we can design a module, an IT module, whether it be one row or so many KW, whatever it is, and then use that as our basis of growth to um, build from. So th that's, that's kind of a very different way. And then in a traditional mo modular data center, that's when we start to see more traditional or could see more traditional air handling units or CROS or different methods that are still designed in a way to to have some modular modularity to them, but they're say not as um, flexible or maybe a little more capital intensive than the other two are. All right, thanks, Bill. Brian, next one's for you. For uninterruptible power, mm -hmm. do you use multiple modular generator units in parallel, or do you use the utility system with a backup generator and a battery backup? I mean, talk, let's talk about redundancy. Sure. I mean, first off, you have to, you may not officially decide to use an Uptime Institute tier rating, but you'll discuss with the client what level of, uh, of uptime they want, what level of reliability they want. That's really going to drive, and, and again, the, the client's application. You know, if we're talking internet use versus you know business corporate use, um, it's going to drive how much redundancy and how much uh, how much you want to use. Uh, so you're going to have it all over the map. You're going to have uh, you can have multiple parallel generators. You can have um, uh, single generators. You can have with utility. The UPSs, uh, one of the discussions is whether you want to have a centralized UPS uh, with, your, uh, with your setup and have that in a container or in a room uh, next to the IT pack, or whether you want to have the IT, the data center uh, containers with uh, in rack or small localized UPSs inside each container. So it really varies. Um, you know what uh, what uh, what level of reliability the client wants and what you want to do whether you want to parallel whether you want to bring in UPSs we've done jobs with continuous power units which combine uh, both uh, generators and a, and a rotary system so there's a lot of different ways to do it okay good good to know we have time for one last question and this is kind of a general question so I'll ask you to share your experience with modular data centers um, Brian, we'll start with you. Are these modular data centers for permanent or for temporary installation or for both? I would say they are for both. Um, where we've seen um, the biggest application, say, among Internet providers uh, is the fact that these containers are excellent when they have to be changed or swapped out uh, every year, two years. In those cases, they're contracting with a, a vendor to provide the completely uh, furnished unit uh, with all the IT servers and then they just simply swap it out at a later date. Uh, but we have applications, universities and others where this is uh, located next to a building, they couldn't afford to expand the building and they needed their data center located right next door to it. So in those, those cases, it's a, a fairly permanent installation. 
A good example of this, I think, is in the high-performance computing or supercomputing world where um, one type of uh, cluster will be built and you use a container, and that type of container or that cluster will be obsolete in, in two years or three years. So I guess you can decide if that's permanent or temporary, but it's outlived its purpose, and if for that um, for that application that had the best um, cost um, uh, price point as well as efficiency and operability. So it depends on how you want to define permanent or temporary. All right, excellent. Well, I'd like to close by thanking our great speakers, Bill Kosick and Brian Renner, for generously sharing their time and expertise. 